Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session, and thank you for coming. My name is Dan Williams from IBM, and this is... Uh, this is Austin, a PhD student from UIUC. And we're going to talk to you about container isolation via virtualization. Don't forget to shrink the guest. Now, if you've been paying attention to the container landscape, especially the runtimes the past few years, you may have noticed a lot of interest in virtualization and how um, the security and isolation of virtual machines can be applied to containers. So here I have a screenshot um, from Cata Containers, which with the tagline, the speed of containers, the security of VMs. Um, we've also seen things like uh, AWS Fire Firecracker, which had secure and fast micro VMs for serverless computing, where this is a virtual machine that's being used for, for serverless, which is very much a container-like uh, environment. Um, just to kind of uh, marry that, that virtual machine and container thing more together, we've seen things like Weave Ignite, which, which explicitly uh, combines the Firecracker micro VMs with OCI images to get that container and VM. Uh, uh, connection going. Um, so much of this stuff uh, has been going on with the virtualization of the containers that it led uh, Phil Estes to write an article in 2019 called Containers in 2019. They're calling it a hypervisor comeback. But you might be thinking, hold on a second, um, aren't VMs kind of big and slow and heavyweight and, and isn't some of the reason that we've been so excited about containers for runtime purposes that they don't have those properties? Like for example, um, what about boot time? How, how fast these things take to start up and, and the memory footprint that, that VMs have, especially when you think about some of these uh, environments like serverless computing, where these types of metrics are really, really important. But of course, um, you know, the, the VMs that, that we're seeing happen uh, in the context of containers are not like the virtual machines of old. Um, in fact, the virtual machines are becoming much, much more lightweight. Um, and, you know, if you look at uh, the AWS Firecracker, they don't call them just you know virtual machines; they call them micro VMs to kind of capture that lightweight essence. Um, and so, to dig a little bit deeper into why and how VMs are becoming lightweight, um, I have a little picture here on the slide, which will um, which represents a kind of standard virtualization stack. So at the bottom, you have a host kernel or a hypervisor. So this would be something like Linux with KVM. On top of that, you'd have a monitor, like the, this is sort of like the, the thing that does the virtualization and uses the, the host kernel and hypervisor. So this would be something like QMU or Cloud Hypervisor or Firecracker, for example. And on top of that, you have the virtual machine itself, which uh, in this picture is shown with a, with a dotted box. Um, the important thing here is that there's a very low level of abstraction between the virtual machine and the host software below. And this is where the isolation and the security from virtual machines is coming from. Inside the virtual machine, you typically have a guest kernel, so normally Linux, um, and your application finally runs on top of that. So given that huge stack that we just we just showed here, there's, there's no wonder that, that VMs have this reputation for being very heavyweight. Now, so the first way to get VMs to be more lightweight is to look at the monitor piece and try to make that thinner. So, and this is what is, is done by uh, AWS Firecracker, for example. They take that piece, the, the, the QMU, for example, and cut out things like PCI and uh, reduce complexity, implement it in a very lightweight way, and um, they end up with much better performance. So I have a graph here that I've, uh, that I've copied from um, a paper on Firecracker from NSDI 2020. And what you see is that Firecracker can boot basically twice as fast as QMU. Um, and this type, of, this type of performance improvement is not, is not uh, this type of um, you know, uh, uh, observation is not new. Um, as far back as 2017, there was a paper in, in, 20, uh, in SOSP that said, my VM is lighter and safer than your container, which had a lot of similar ideas about having a very lightweight monitor process. But there's another piece to the lightweight, uh, to making this stack more lightweight, and that is the guest. So if you see, um, even though we have a thin process, uh, thin monitor now, we still have a pretty heavyweight guest there. And there has been some work uh, to make the guest lighter, both in user space for the guest, so going from, let's say, an Ubuntu container to an Alpine Linux container, and also through kernel configuration for that guest kernel, things like. TinyX, which was from that same SOSP paper that we mentioned. 
Um, but the question that we asked here is in this context, how thin can you go? Well, what is the what is the thinnest that you can get that guest kernel piece to kind of complete this process of making VMs lightweight? And if you think about it, the most thin guest that you can possibly imagine is a unikernel. And if you uh, if you recall, unikernels were were very had a lot of um, excitement around them a few years ago. And um, what they are is basically thin guests to the extreme. So a unikernel is an application that is linked only with those library OS components that it needs to run directly on the virtual hardware abstraction. So you can think of this as a virtual machine with no guest OS like Linux inside and just the application and whatever library components it needs to run. Um, the original unikernels were language specific. So Mirage OS, for example, used OCaml. But since then, there's been a lot more kind of legacy oriented unikernels, things like Rump Run, which is based on NetBSD, as well as Hermitux and OSV, which are uh, which claim uh, binary compatibility with Linux. And so these properties that unikernels have, so things like small kernel size, fast boot time, performance security, these all seem like things that we want, and, and those are great properties. However, there's a big downside to the unikernels, which is the lack of full Linux support. So for instance, Hermitux is only supporting 97 system calls. Um, OSB has a, a, a laundry list of um, kind of criteria that your application has to obey in order to be able to be run on it. Um, and this leads these, these unikernel communities to have to kind of maintain and curate applications uh, to run on their, on their platforms. So what we what we really need to get more kind of general um, general use in the container community is is something that that can you know is is really as general as Linux but has a lot of these same properties and so the question we asked is can Linux be as small as and boot as fast as and actually outperform uh, unikernels and to do this we um, looked into uh, uh, something that we call Lupine Linux. Uh, which is trying to make uh, Linux act and look as much as possible like a unikernel. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Austin now to tell you exactly what we did in this study. But um, hopefully this doesn't take too much of his thunder. Uh, the answer is yes, we can, we can get Linux to be that small. And uh, Austin is going to now tell you how. Hello. So the idea is Lupa Linux is that we take an application container and we specialize the kernel just for the application. So we apply unikernel-like technique to specialize the Linux source and get our new kernel that's called Lupa. And for the fix that is running along with the kernel, we take the application container image and then directly translate that into a disk that can be used in the virtual machine. So unikernels are all about specialization. As definition, um, unikernel includes only what is needed. And surprisingly, Linux is very configurable. You get uh, more than 60,000 configuration options from the kconfig, and the options include everything you need, including drivers, file systems, uh, network protocols, and power features. So, we specialize Linux through configuration, and our starting point is Firecracker Micro VM configuration, which takes roughly about 5% uh, of the configuration space. But Lupine uh, removes more options. So first, we classify 283 options that is essential for the VM to work, and we call these options Lupine base. And remaining options are either application specific or potentially unnecessary. So those remaining options are application specific and potentially unnecessary because some of them are multi-processing and some of them are about hardware management. And the reason I said it's potentially unnecessary is that we only we uh, we can only dis answer this question uh, until we answer these two uh, two questions. The first question is, do we need to support for multiple trust domains? Since it's a lightweight VM and there's only one container and application are going to run on our VM. So options relating to uh, isolating and accounting for processes might not be necessary. 
such as C-groups and namespaces and all the kernel security features. And the other question is, do we need to support for general hardware? Since it's a virtual machine and virtual machines are by definition going to run on a hypervisor. So it's not going to be run on a general hardware. So it's not a surprise that MicroVM has already get rid of a lot of drivers and hardware related components in the kernel. But in Lupine, we removed more, including things like power management and CPU, uh, CPU frequencies. So for application specific options, I can give you some examples. The first obvious one is system codes. So some system codes that you can uh, enable or disable and make it optional in your kernel. But however, if your application happens to use those system codes, you need to make sure they are in your kernel. So for example, Nginx server needs eventfd because it's an event-driven uh, framework and I use EPO and eventfd system calls. And there are other features like kernel services, reading from uh, process file systems, are also need to be configured uh, to meet application requirement. And not to mention that th those crypto and compression routines. So the way we get an application specific Lupine is that we start from Lupine base, the minimum kernel we get. And then we add application specific option gradually. And this whole process is guided by application output and it's sort of manual and sometimes trial and error. So if the application complains that this, the few text facility return an unexpected error code that you, you know, oh, there's something wrong about few text and you probably need to add the uh, config few text back into your kernel. And the more you do it, the, the sooner you can get it done. But in general, it's still a hard problem for us. So now let's take a look at the evaluation. And we are, we are going to uh, verify that Lupine gets, uh, we're going to see if Lupine can achieve the uh, unique kernel benefits we mentioned. So this is our evaluation setup. And each VM is given one vCPU and 512 megabytes of, of memory. And our hypervisor is Firecracker because MicroVM is the uh, main object that we compare against. So we are going to measure kernel size and uh, boot time and memory footprint and application performance, all these good unique kernel properties. And to make the evaluation more interesting, we are adding a more uh, version of Lupine that we call Lupine General. Lupine General supports 20 top applications on Docker Hub, which dominates 83% of the downloads. And to our surprise, there's, there are only 19 configuration options that are required on the top of Lupine base in order to support those 20 applications. So we added a new option, a new version of Lupine that we call Lupine General in the evaluation. So first, kernel image size. We see that the configuration is very, very effective because Lupine is already, is only four megabytes and it's only 27 percent of the micro VA in size and lupine general the one that supports 20 applications is only slightly larger than the lupine and it's still much smaller than micro VA. and when, when comparing to unikernel systems lupine general is still smaller than some unikernels including hermitox and osv and for boot time, the boot time is measured by an IO port written from the guest, notifying that the, the, the hypervisor that the boot has uh, complete. And we see that Lupine boots much faster than MicroVN. And Lupine general is it's also uh, slightly slower than Lupine while still outperforming MicroVM a lot. And when comparing to unique kernels, Lupine General still boots faster than Hermitox and OSV, uh, these two 
uh, unikernel systems and be comparable to the others. And for memory footprint, the way we measure memory footprint is that we try to find the minimum amount of memory that is required for the application VM to work. So the way we do it is that we repeatedly test application with decreasing memory allocation. So when we keep decreasing the memory to a point, the application will stop working. So at that point, we know this is the minimum amount of memory that your system needs. So we found that the we do that we do this evaluation three, for three different applications, including Hello World, Nginx, and Radius. And we found that Lupine and Lupine General saves uh, roughly about 28% in terms of uh, minimum required memory compared to micro VM. And when comparing to other unikernel systems, it is still it's still comparable to unikernel systems, but sometimes those unikernel systems are, are some applications are not supported by those unikernels. So that's why we uh, skip the evaluation. And so for, for application performance, we measure radius and nginx, and the throughput is normalized to micro VM. And we see that Lupi outperforms micro VM by up to 29%. And surprisingly, Lupine General is just, Lupine General just as good as Lupine. And some, and the, for the other unit kernel systems, they are either performing not so well or just doesn't run the application at all. And here's just some related work that people trying to leverage Linux to achieve some unit kernel benefits, including live VM, X containers, and UKL. And there are some studies about how you can, how much security benefits you can get by configuring your kernel. So for example, you see that 85% oh, of the attack surface can be reduced via configuration. So now I'm going to segue back to Daniel for opening challenges. Okay, great. Thanks, Austin. Um, so just to kind of give a bit of a summary about some of the, some of the key takeaways that we get from that evaluation that, that Austin showed us. Um, the first one is that, is that specialization is really important. So if you remember um, what we were talking about, which was that we want to have this, this guest VM as well as the monitor be as lightweight as possible so we can get these properties that are so important for container-like workloads, um, specialization is really key. So what we found was um, that we could get 73% smaller image size, 59% faster boot time, 28% lower memory footprint, and 33 higher throughput than the state-of-the-art micro VM. So what this means is that even though uh, in the context of, of AWS Firecracker, the kernel has already been slimmed down to something that's fairly small. Even with that, um, there's a lot of performance that is left on the table that, uh, that, that we could possibly take through specialization. The other point that, that I wanted to make was that um, even though specialization is important, um, specialization per individual applications, which is what we were showing in that evaluation, what Austin was showing us, um, specialization per the app, each application may not be quite so important. And this is actually really good news. Um, what this means is that this process of trying to figure out what exactly the configuration, the most lightweight configuration for each application is, uh, may not be necessary. So for instance, we found that the, the Lupine General, which had, you know, which covered 83% um, of downloaded apps from Docker Hub, um, had a most 4% reduction in performance um, from the kind of targeted manual um, specialization per application. So, that, so that's, uh, again, so that's a really good news in terms of being able to run um, and be able to apply specialization in a more general, uh, general setting. And really, um, these are the challenges and these are the discussions that we wanted to bring up to the, uh, to the broader community today is, 
how do we get these special specialization benefits into the community? So we know what they are now. We've measured them. We've seen them. Um, and we want to be able to get those into the micro VM community so that our, our VMs are even less like that turtle that we saw at the start and, and more like, I don't know, the, the future, I guess. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately, there are a number of, of challenges that we, we do not yet know how to solve. So the first one is how, how we know whether or not this Lupine general uh, configuration is general enough for the uh, for you know a wide variety of workloads, um, so I mentioned that it was a great thing that we didn't have to do the per application specialization. But there's always this this question of if we give you a specialized configuration, will it work for your workload? And we don't know how to guarantee that. Um, so you know any kind of ideas and, uh, and and things things like that from the community, we'd be very happy to have um, either. You know, this could go in a few different directions. It could go towards trying to discover exactly what uh, requirements from the from the guest kernels are needed versus uh, some fallback me mechanisms. What do you do if you do over specialize? I think there's a lot of opportunity there um, for for future work. Um, the second challenge that I wanted to point out is that um, while the experiments that we showed so, show, uh, demonstrated a big improvement. Um, these were done kind of outside of a lot of the pieces of the container ecosystem. And the container ecosystem itself might be generating um, some tension against specialization inside the micro VM. So for example, if you think about something like Kata containers, there's an agent inside of the, the VMs which is responsible for sort of managing the life cycle of the containers that are running inside these micro VMs. Um, and if you think about some of the things that we were cutting out in order to get our benefits, um, you know, the, the features of the agent, which are, are much more kind of like um, system-like features rather than application-like features, may be pushing uh, towards a more general configuration, whereas the specialization that we were advocating for is pushing towards less of a system-like configuration and more of a, you know, specialized application-like uh, configuration. So I think that there's this kind of uh, tension here that, that is, is not, not super well understood uh, at this point. And uh, another interesting area for future work is how we can sort of look at the agent design, how, how we can build these agents, integrate with the rest of the ecosystem without kind of uh, throwing away all the specialization benefits. So um, with that, um, you know, we're, we're really happy to have um, have had the opportunity to uh, talk to the community like this, and we hope that uh, that we can, you know, continue this conversation about how we can take these specialization insights and apply them um, not just to monitors but to the entire virtualization stack. Um, if you would like more information about uh, the Lupine work that we had uh, that 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 Austin presented, um, we do have a paper in Neurosys uh, 2020 um, that you can check out there. Um, our configurations and our kernel are open source um, at the GitHub uh, link posted. And uh, feel free to email either myself, um, uh, Dan Williams, uh, which is djwilliam at usibm.com, or Austin, um, hckuo2 at illinois.edu. Thank you, and have a nice day. Okay, are we are we on? Yes, I think All right. so. <laughs> All right, great. So, so thank you for everybody for um, for listening to the uh, the recorded part of the talk, and uh, now we're going to do a little bit of uh, of the questions that have been coming in. Um, so, <clears throat> one of the questions here is about the trial and error process of increment incrementally adding dependencies and trying to really trying to figure out um, what that maximum amount of specialization that you can get without um, breaking um, without breaking compatibility with your application. And, uh, you know, it was pointed out in the question that um, already with things like Alpine Linux, this is this is very trial and error. And um, it's it's a it's, it's kind of a difficult problem to solve in general. And um, I think this is a really great point. Um, so I just wanted to share a couple of ideas that we've had 
uh, related to, to how, how you could go about trying to do this. So I think one thing is um, if you think about perhaps somehow tying this into like a CI CD environment or something like that, it might be possible to automatically try different uh, kernel configurations in your micro VM and, and, and just you know see if your test cases are, are actually happening. I don't know of people who are actually doing this in practice, um, but I think as, as we look at specialization more, especially for micro VMs, I think it's gonna become more important. Um, the other idea that could happen is um, having some kind of like reactionary approach. So it's possible that at runtime, you could, you could actually switch out it, uh, to a more, uh, more general version of the kernel. Um, the implications on performance, on security are a little bit questionable there. Um, but but that's that that's another case, and then finally a, a third a third um, idea here is that you could potentially take something that you already have about the application. So for example, if you have a seccomp profile which says um, you know basically my application is no longer going to use these system calls, you could use that also as a way to guide your um, specialization of the kernel to some extent. Um, Austin, do you want to take? Do you have anything else on that, or do you want to take the next one? Yeah, I can take care of the next one. So another question that people have is that can we use some sort of tracing mechanism to figure out what kernel configuration options that application needs? So out to automate this uh, process to get a to get a Lupine configuration. And yes, we can do that. And I did some work that is related to that before, but one insight I get from our work is that sometimes you get false positives. So for example, your application does not need security features like KPTI, but if you use those kind of tracing uh, approach, you get like whatever that is used, but not necessary, but not essentially necessary. So yes, you can do that, but for the purpose of Lupin, we want to specialize the kernel to that extreme, so that's why we choose this manual way. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a good point because so some of the things when you're specializing are are um, you know just functionality things like you know inclusion or not inclusion of a system call implementation is is a very kind of straightforward thing that may or may not work. You know, inclusion or not inclusion of the the PocFS or the SysFS, for example. I mean, these things are are you know they're very binary. Um, they either work or they don't. But there are some other things that um, Austin was alluding to here, which are a little bit more complex or, or more difficult to think about. So it might be that you want a particular file system that has certain properties, but it's under the same file system API as some other file system. So if you go from ext4 to ext2, um, ext2 is potentially a simpler file system, but you might be losing a lot of the benefits from ext4 without even realizing it. So these are some of the other kind of nuances that go on into the, some of these dis decisions, um, and especially like you know, uh, you know, this ext example might be a little bit contrived, but especially when you start thinking about um, security and uh, security options that you may want in the kernel that are you know enabled or disabled, but you can't necessarily you, your application works either way. It's just maybe it's working in a less secure uh, environment. And. Uh, some questions are asking about if we open source the project, and yes, we we do. And the Lupine is now open source at a link I just published. So feel free to check it out. Yeah. So there's there's another question on here about um, using BPF trace to record the system calls and the open files. Um, so. I, I don't know. I don't know about you, Austin, but um, I haven't. Uh, I haven't. I haven't looked at BF, BPF trace at all. Um, I think that in in general, I think that Austin had made you know kind of a comment about uh, tracing like approaches and the fact that you know you're always going to get into this this uh, situation where you're not sure if the test thing that you're tracing is the same as as what you actually need. Um, but it, it, uh, you know, I think the better the tracing framework, the better, the more information you can get. And, you know, if BPF trace is a, is, is a way that we can have more robust tracing or you know, more informative tracing in some ways, um, that could be very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
Let's see. Um, so there's this other one down here. Um, do you think it's possible to automate the process of creating a kernel for a specific container? Besides system call inclusion, surely there are other type of configurations that could be required by apps. Um, yeah, so, I mean, like, you know, I, I think that we're, you know, most of the questions are around the same sort of basic idea, which is like, you know, I think that what we've got so far is we know that that um, we have some evidence now that 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 getting the uh, getting this kind of specialized kernel or specialized micro VM uh, image is, is is going to be uh, valuable in some way. But um, you know, the questions are absolutely right. The um, the big challenge here is is how how can you get these things um, uh, automatically? Um, I think one other point to make, though, that or to drive home a little bit is, um, you know, the degree of specialization that um, really seems to matter, at least from our, our evaluation that we've done in this work, is, um, is, is you don't need specialization that is so fine grained that, um, you know, you need to know every single little system call and, and, and do those types of things. Um, this type of specialization that we're talking about um, if, if you remember the, the slide that, that Austin showed, the Lupine General, which was this configuration which had um, basically it was the union of all these different smaller configurations that we had together. So in, in some sense, it was a much more general purpose specialized kernel. It was still very specialized, but it was more general than uh, individual ones. And uh, that, that particular one showed us that that maybe fine-grained specialization isn't really as important as we may have originally thought. So I think when we think about some of these tools to automate how to get the specialization, I think that um, it's important to, to remember that, that we don't need to go, you know, we don't need to go too crazy with, with how specialized we're looking. If, if it's a pretty coarse-grained hammer, um, it's, probably, uh, it's probably good enough. Yep. All right. So, are there any um, any other questions that are coming in in here? Um, let's see. Okay, so I think. Um, oh, oh, so there. Yeah. Um, so there was there was one other question which had to do with um, what, how how uh, the micro VMs in general are tying into uh, or or related to things like Kubert, um, and I think. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert on Kubevert, um, but I, I believe they, they kind of play slightly different roles. Um, the micro VM should be thought of sort of more like, uh, you know, container runtime um, you know, alternatives. Um, so, for instance, Firecracker can be connected to things like uh, Container D um, with Firecracker Container D. Um, <laughs> I think that um, another thing that, that is related to this is that the uh, the, the the containers themselves, um, you know, they they have uh, certain rich functionalities that that sometimes the isolation boundary can get in the way of. And um, I think that another point, which um, you know, is is a big area of of interest to us, is how how when you're in this more isolated environment, how how do you still manage to support a lot of these container like uh, functionalities um, that you need. So, uh, in some sense, some of that may be at odds with what we've been showing today. We've been showing that um, things like um, we've been showing that things like um, you know uh, uh, specialization can can give you a lot of benefits. But if you if you need to put in some of these more general type of um, uh, uh, protections or, or the, these these general um, uh, general container runtime support things they might might be at odds. So these are things like having agents like the Cata agent inside the VM and things like that. So we're we're sort of interested in that trade off as well. Um, I think we're we're at the end of the questions. Um, so uh, thank you all for for coming to the to the session, and um, we're going to be hanging out on the uh, the runtime Slack. Yeah. Um, and we'll be there yeah. for, for a little while. So if you have further questions or you want further discussions, um, we're more than happy to, uh, to hear your thoughts. So um, thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye.